Whether your sport is chasing giraffe, playing football, or riding a bicycle, good physical fitness is important. This is Dick Butkus speaking for Nautilus Sports Medical Industries, and I would like to talk with you about negative work and its place in full range exercise. Modern electronic instruments make it possible to measure and graphically demonstrate a number of important factors, factors of particular importance in sports. With a force plate, for example, it's possible to measure the exact forces imposed upon the body in any activity. Such measurements make it possible to clearly understand why some activities are safe and why some apparently safe activities are actually quite dangerous. In very simple terms, the force plate might be considered a type of scale with two important differences degree of accuracy and speed. As we'll demonstrate a bit later, the force plate is accurate almost beyond belief, and its speed is so great that it far surpasses any practical need. The built-in delay is something on the order of one five hundred thousandth of a second. Linked to an electronic scope, the force plate measures the changing forces, and the scope displays these forces. The horizontal line across the middle of the scope can be adjusted to indicate almost any pre-selected level of force. Then, so long as the blip moves straight across the scope, we have a clear indication that the force is remaining perfectly constant. However, if the forces change, the blip will move above or below the midline. When the blip moves above the midline, this indicates that the force has been increased. And, of course, movement below the midline indicates a reduction in force. And, the greater the movement, the greater the change in force. A slight movement indicates a small change in force. A large movement indicates a great change in force. But force isn't the only thing displayed by the scope. We're also provided with a clear picture of the time factor. Since the blip moves across the scope at an almost perfectly constant speed, it follows that the lines on the scope will be steeper if the forces change suddenly. So it's obvious that at least two important factors are measured by the force plate and displayed by the scope. The level of force imposed on the body and the speed with which the force changes. Given these two important measurements, it then becomes possible to determine what really happens during almost any activity. What's safe? And what's dangerous? And why is it dangerous? With these tools, it becomes possible to remove the guesswork, replace opinion with the facts. Momentum is a factor of great importance in the field of exercise, and I believe the following demonstration will make this perfectly clear. While I certainly can't lift this car, I can push it on level ground. But, please take notice, the car continues to move even though I've stopped pushing. The car continues to move because of momentum. And the exact same thing happens in exercise. The momentum involved in exercise can also be demonstrated very clearly with a five pound barbell plate. If I lift the weight smoothly and steadily, very little momentum is developed and the weight remains fairly constant. However, faster movement produces an entirely different situation. Rapid movement does produce a meaningful amount of momentum, and the result is obvious. The weight continues to rise simply from its own momentum. Movement produces force. The faster the movement, the greater the force. The force plate, which is connected to the oscilloscope, is so sensitive that it can accurately and instantly record the force of my heartbeat when I remain perfectly still. But the recording of my heartbeat remains accurate only so long as I stand perfectly still. Then, if I move even slightly, the additional forces produced by that movement will be recorded on the oscilloscope. In fact, this instrument is so sensitive, it can even measure the airways produced by speech. For example, notice the oscilloscope while I count. One. Two, three, four, five. Or when I clap. And you're probably asking yourself, what does all this have to do with strength training? Well, the answer is it has a great deal to do with strength training because it permits you to measure what really happens during an exercise as opposed to what you think or believe happens. Remember, movement produces force. And the movements involved in exercise produce enormous force. The following demonstration with the barbell will make this perfectly clear. As I curl slowly, 
The forces remain constant. Then, if I increase the speed of movement, the forces change. And if I go really fast, the forces increase tremendously. At the moment, some people are recommending an explosive style of training. In effect, jerking or throwing the weight instead of lifting it. So, let's just see what exactly does happen when a weight is lifted explosively. If I lift the weight smoothly and steadily, the forces remain fairly constant. But, if the weight is moved explosively, then enormous forces are imposed upon your body. Such a style of training is not productive, regardless of what a few self-proclaimed experts would have you believe. In fact, such a style of training is probably the least productive style of training, and very dangerous. When a weight is moved suddenly, enormous forces are imposed on the body at the start of the movement. Then, because of the momentum, the weight literally floats through the rest of the movement. The effect being, the muscles and joints are jerked violently at the start of the movement, and provided with little or nothing in a way of resistance through the rest of the movement. Isokinetic forms of exercise were supposed to solve the problem of momentum in exercise. But claims are one thing, and the facts are sometimes an entirely different matter. With the use of a force plate, it becomes possible to determine exactly what does occur during an isokinetic exercise provided by the so-called leaper. If the leaper lives up to its claims, then it should provide a perfectly smooth curve of resistance. Maximum resistance in every position. But that's the claim. The facts, as undeniably demonstrated by the force plate, happen to be an entirely different story. Remember, the problems caused by momentum and exercise are a result of sudden changes in force, jerking and yanking the muscles in a very dangerous manner. With that important point clearly in mind, let's now see what actually happens during an isokinetic exercise. Exactly contrary to its claims, it should now be obvious that the resistance provided by the leaper is far from being smooth. In fact, a close look at the lines of force displayed on the scope make it clear that the resistance is even jerkier than that provided by a barbell. The jagged peaks on the scope are a result of sudden and violent changes in the resistance. And while it's perfectly true that the resistance should change during the movement, it's also true that the resistance should change smoothly. Such sudden changes in resistance are dangerous. But what causes these changes? A close look at the scope in a moment of consideration will make the answer to that question obvious. The violent changes in force are a result of the fact that the mechanism is hanging up and then releasing in rapid succession. Rather than moving smoothly, the machine moves in a series of short, rapid jerks. While the machine is hung up, movement stops for a tiny fraction of a second, and the force rises. Then the machine breaks loose and moves almost freely for another brief instant. And during the period of movement, the force drops. Drops suddenly and violently. Thus, the overall movement actually consists of a large number of very small movements. Really a series of stops and jerks. A far cry from the claims made for this device. So the facts are one thing, the claims another. Rather than solving the problem of momentum and exercise, an isokinetic form of resistance simply made the matter worse. Isokinetic exercises are based on friction. Instead of using weights or springs as a source of resistance, isokinetic forms of exercise are supposed to limit the speed of movement. The theory being that a limited speed of movement provides maximum resistance throughout the full range of movement. But that's the theory. The facts are an entirely different matter. Because, in fact, a full range exercise based on isokinetic resistance is simply impossible. A full range exercise has at least nine basic requirements. And even if one of these nine requirements is not provided, full range exercise is impossible. Isokinetic forms of exercise provide only one of these nine basic requirements for full range exercise. 
That's right, one. One requirement out of nine. And just what are these nine basic requirements for full range exercise? Well, let's take them one at a time. The first requirement is stretching. Without stretching, a full range exercise is simply impossible. Without stretching, any form of exercise becomes a very limited mid-range movement. So stretching is certainly an absolute requirement for full range exercise. A requirement for improving flexibility, for maintaining flexibility, and even for the prevention of a loss in flexibility. Stretching is a direct result of negative work. Without negative work, stretching is not provided. And isokinetic exercises do not provide negative work. The unavoidable result being that isokinetic exercises do not provide stretching. In contrast, a proper full range exercise does provide stretching and will improve flexibility. During a major research program at the United States Military Academy, West Point, a large number of football players were trained with Nautilus full range exercises, exercises that do involve stretching. In a period of only six weeks, these athletes improved their flexibility to a marked degree. By comparison to another group of football players, a control group, a group that trained with conventional exercises, their improvement in flexibility was literally dramatic. In one area of movement, the Nautilus trained group of athletes improved their flexibility more than 10 times as much as the control group. Not 10 percent, 10 times, literally 1,000 percent. In a second area of movement, the Nautilus group improved exactly 11 times as much as the control group, 1,100 percent. And in a third area of movement, the Nautilus group improved more than 20 times as much as the control group, in excess of 2,000 percent. Those are the kind of results that are possible, but only with a proper full range exercise that does provide stretching. The second requirement is pre-stretching without which a high intensity of muscular contraction is impossible. Pre-stretching is a requirement for the neurological stimulation that is essential to a high intensity of muscular contraction. Without pre-stretching, it is literally impossible to produce a truly high intensity of muscular contraction. The result being that only part of the available muscle fibers are actually involved in the exercise. In effect, pre-stretching makes it possible to work harder and really hard work, high intensity work, is the key to success in exercises performed for the purpose of increasing strength. Pre-stretching of a muscle is produced when a movement is preceded by a sudden, short movement in the opposite direction. You're pre-stretching your muscles when you pull back your arm just before delivering a punch. Pre-stretching when you backswing a baseball bat or a golf club. A common example of pre-stretching in strength training occurs in the bench press, when the bar is dropped a very short distance immediately prior to the start of the upwards lift. Pre-stretching is also involved when you dip by bending your legs just prior to jumping. But please take note that pre-stretching is a result of negative work, a force pulling in the opposite direction just before a fast, strong, positive movement. The third requirement is a rotary form of movement, providing full range, omnidirectional resistance. A rotary form of exercise is an absolute requirement for full range exercise for an obvious and very simple reason because the direction of movement of the involved body parts is constantly changing during any form of moving exercise. Thus, the direction of resistance application must also change instantly, automatically, exactly. And this is possible only when the body axis is rotating on a common axis with the exercise machine. In the pullover machine, the upper arms are rotating around the axis of the shoulders, and the machine rotates on the same axis. The result being that the resistance is always applied directly opposite to the momentary direction of movement. The fourth requirement is direct resistance. The resistance must be directly opposed to the involved body part in every position. The resistance in a full range exercise must be directly opposed to the constantly changing direction of movement during the exercise. If not, then resistance is provided during only part of the movement and full range exercise becomes impossible. In the Nautilus pullover machine, for example, the resistance is applied to the elbows, where it belongs, because the powerful muscles of the upper torso are connected to and directly move the upper arms. With this arrangement of direct resistance, it becomes possible to provide exercise throughout a range of movement exceeding 270 degrees. Whereas, in contrast, the range of movement provided in a conventional exercise for the same muscle groups is limited to approximately 122 degrees. The full range exercise actually provides more than twice the range of movement involved in the conventional exercise. 
The fifth requirement is automatically variable resistance, a source of resistance that actually changes as the movement occurs, changes instantly and automatically. The movements that occur during any exercise produce large-scale changes in available strength, so the resistance must vary as movement occurs, must vary instantly, automatically, and the only possible way to provide this variation in resistance is by the use of a cam. The Nautilus cam varies the resistance properly, in the only way possible. Nautilus was the first to recognize the requirement for variation of the resistance during exercise, and Nautilus is still the only form of proper variation in resistance. The sixth requirement is balance resistance. The resistance must vary in accord with the actual requirements of the muscles. If not, then varying the resistance may make the situation worse rather than better. So the resistance certainly must vary, but it must vary properly, must be balanced in relation to the actual needs. Nautilus is the only source of full range exercise. The seventh requirement is positive work a source of resistance that provides work during the positive or concentric part of a movement. A source of resistance during the positive or lifting part of an exercise is common to almost all forms of exercise. And positive work is the only requirement for full range exercise that is provided by an isokinetic exercise machine such as the leaper. One requirement out of nine. The eighth requirement is negative work, a source of resistance that provides work during the negative or eccentric part of a movement. Resistance during the negative part of an exercise is another absolutely indisputable requirement for full range exercise. Without negative work, stretching is not provided, pre-stretching is not provided, and resistance in the finishing position of full muscular contraction is not provided. Thus, if any one of the nine requirements for full range exercise is really basic, then that requirement is certainly negative work. And remember, no form of isokinetic exercise provides even the slightest amount of negative work. According to the promoters of some isokinetic devices, negative work is somehow evil, of no value, dangerous, hogwash, pure, unadulterated bunk. The negative part of any exercise is certainly the most important part of the exercise. The ninth requirement is resistance in the position of full muscular contraction, in the finishing position of an exercise. A full range exercise obviously must have resistance in every position throughout a full range of possible movement and that includes the finishing position of an exercise, the position of full muscular contraction. Most conventional exercises do not provide resistance in the finishing position, and no isokinetic exercise does. In a bench press, for example, the weight is locked out in the finishing position and is supported entirely by the bones, and exactly the same thing occurs in most conventional exercises. The standing press, the leg press, the squat, and many other exercises. In contrast, a truly full range exercise, such as that provided by the Nautilus hip and back machine, does have resistance in every position, including the important finishing position. You can't lock out and hold the finishing position without muscular effort. Work is provided in all positions. The previously covered nine factors are all basic requirements for full range exercise. Even if one of these nine factors is not provided, then full range exercise is simply impossible. And remember, Isokinetic exercises provide only one of nine requirements, one out of nine. Those nine requirements for full range exercise are simply beyond dispute. But there's also another factor, a tenth factor, which may or may not be an actual requirement for full range exercise. Personally, I think it is an actual requirement, but that's my opinion, and I'm trying to present the facts, not my opinions. So this last factor may or may not be an actual requirement for full range exercise, but at the very least, it certainly is a factor of great importance. The tenth factor is speed. Personally, I believe a proper full range exercise requires an unlimited speed of movement. After all, just what is the proper speed of movement during exercise? The best speed of movement? Well, quite frankly, I simply don't know, and neither does anybody else. So, since we don't know the proper speed of movement during an exercise, it certainly doesn't make much sense to limit ourselves in this regard. But that's exactly what the promoters of isokinetic exercise have done limited the speed of movement, forced us to train at an arbitrary, pre-selected speed. The following conversation with Coach Bill Bradford was filmed more than a year ago. Since then, he's had another untied, undefeated season, his fifth in a row. I believe his opinions on this subject are quite valuable, and his record speaks for itself. A number of people have recently stated varying opinions regarding the value of the negative part of exercise. 
Coach Bill Bradford of DeLand High School in DeLand, Florida, probably has more experience with the negative part of exercise than any man in the world. He has an undefeated, untied record as a high school weightlifting coach. So I think his opinion on this subject should be pretty valuable. Bill, just what is your opinion of negative work? About five years ago, Dick, uh, I was fortunate enough to be involved in some research in negative type of exercise with Arthur Jones. And uh, over a period of months, uh, we were able to come up with some uh, very important data on negative type of training, and it was quite successful. So I said, well, if we did this, why not try it on my competitive weightlifters? And so uh, I've been using negative resistance on my weightlifters ever since, and uh, we've had four state championship teams and 46 wins, and uh, it's, it, it's an, the most important part of our training program in competitive weightlifting. Okay, now, you, now we're speaking about your weightlifting team. Now, what, what happens with the baseball team, the football team, the swimming team at, say, like Deland High School? Do you incorporate that there, too? Well, uh, we train all the different teams. I do. I have a part of it over the years. And uh, this past year, I can say that in the 20 years of coaching, our football team was the strongest overall group of athletes I've ever seen in high school level. Hmm. Not only... And we used negative type of exercise with them. I mean, not only uh, they were uh, had a tremendous amount of strength, but the quickness. I mean, you find four seven, four eight. Uh, we had one youngster uh, four five. So we used negative exercise on all of our different athletes. For best results, full range exercise is a must, and only Nautilus provides all the requirements for full range exercise.